Nope. It's still a big green M that pulses whenever you speak. I love that. Well, Linda, okay. I don't see Katie's. Hey, um, um, I'm pressing. I had to go into Google Chrome oh, in order to connect no, with this call. I had a hard time oh. connecting to today. Oh. oh, now everything just went dead. Um, You're still very much alive here. I had an easy time connecting to <laughs> If you log out and go in through Google Chrome, that circular. No, that's, uh, Do you have hmm. tape or something over your camera that's blocking? There you are. There you are. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'll like comb my hair. You got to see me. Yeah, just keep clicking. That's all. Yes. <laughs> Good. Wonderful. Uh, Laura, you said Canice. Uh, Hasn't joined us yet? Is she yes, she's not joining us yet. I don't see her. I, I, I can't say that I remember whether she was going to join us or not. Yeah. Good. Well, let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. Ahab, son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than any of his predecessors. It was not enough for him to follow the, son, the sins of Jeroboam. He even married Jezebel, daughter of Ethel, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. O God, our Heavenly Father, down through the ages you have called us to be faithful to you. <laughs> down through the ages, over and over again, we have been unfaithful. But you continue to present yourself to us, to reveal your power. Help us to be more attentive to you in our lives. Able to hear your word and have the courage to call you. You alone. We ask this through Christ. Our Lord. <coughs> Good. Well, welcome, everybody. Good to have you here. Um, just to remind you, this is the last time we're going to be meeting until September. September 3rd, we'll meet again. But I'm, I'm finally getting away off to uh, the Martha's Vineyard on the day, so I'll be away for a while. But th this week we have some really, really interesting readings, and it's, I, I think it's kind of providential that we're studying Sunday's readings on the Feast of the Feast on the Feast of Transfiguration of the Lord, when we see our Lord reveal himself in his glorified form of Peter, James, and John. <coughs> Sunday's readings hear our God reveal himself in various ways. And we need to be reminded that, that God in, in all kinds of ways does indeed reveal himself to us. We just have to be attentive to him. So I'd, I'd like to I'd invite you to keep that in the, in the back of your mind as we're studying this Sunday's readings. Um, <clears throat> this Sunday's first reading is from the first book of Kings. Uh, we heard from the first book of Kings just two weeks ago. Uh, and as you know, it's one of the one of the um, historical books. <clears throat> Jeannie, Jeannie wants to join us. Hello, Jeannie, come join us. Joyce, how are you? Good to have you here. Wow, this is really crowding up. It's marvelous. Good, good to have you all here. Um, so remember that the, the One Kings is one of the historical books. Hello, Jeannie, how are you? Good to see you. Joyce, good to see you too. Um, it was written before the fall of Jerusalem. In its final redaction, what we have today, it probably dates to around the time after its fall. And so like the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the book of Kings, uh, the two books of Kings, 
were, were presented to admonish the people, to lead them back to God, to help them see how when they turned away from God, terrible things happened. And it's only when they were faithful to God that, that they lived in peace. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a real good reminder to us too, uh, thousands of years later. Okay? Um, let's let's go to the historical section of setting for this account. So do you have your, your biblical timelines? You want to pull that out? You'll see very clearly that this indeed was uh, presenting a particular historical moment in ancient Israel. You'll recall that Solomon succeeded David as king. And for a while, Solomon was faithful to God. He even built a temple to God. <laughs> and he used the wisdom that God had given him to serve his people well. But then, as we read in 1 Kings 12, his, his wives turned uh -oh. on his son uh -oh. And so he then started worshiping false gods. And as a result of that, after he died, his kingdom was divided. And we have the northern kingdom with, <clears throat> with Jeroboam, his son, as the king. And we have the southern kingdom with Rehoboam, one of his cousins, as the king. And they, 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 they seem to be in a contest to see who would be worse. Uh, they were terrible <laughs> rulers, for the most part. There were a few exceptions, but most of them were really bad rulers, as, as you see in the, the opening prayer that I used today. Uh, they had <clears throat> did everything wrong in the sight of God. So Ahab is the descendant as king of Jeroboam, that's the northern kingdom. And what's the capital of the northern kingdom? Anybody? The capital? Is it Samaria? Pardon? Is it Samaria? Samaria, no, the, the capital of the southern kingdom is Jerusalem. Oh, southern, Judah. Judah. The, the northern kingdom is Israel, right? So. Was it Jerusalem? No, the Are you kingdom. asking the northern and the southern? The northern kingdom is Israel, and the capital of that is Samaria. Oh, Samaria. Yeah. The, the <coughs> capital of the southern kingdom is, is, is Jerusalem. <clears throat> okay, and so if you look at your little timeline, you'll see that Jeroboam succeeded Solomon in the northern kingdom. After him came Nadab, Baasha, and Ella, and then uh, Ahab. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that Elijah started to prophesy during the time of Ahab. Okay. So that, that sets the historical setting, okay? Uh, and we're, we're dealing with the northern kingdom, okay? And this is the ninth century. About, about 100 years before the northern kingdom was finally absorbed into Assyria. Um, now, the, the account that we hear on Sunday concerns this Ahab, this king Ahab, and Elijah. Let's, let's open to one king. Chapter 16. And you see, I started to read from verse 29 about Ahab. He began, if you look at verse 31, he began to serve Baal and worship him. It goes on, it gets worse and worse. It says, Ahab set up an altar to Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, and also made an Asherah. What's an Asherah? An altar. No. It's for the goddess of fertility. Isn't it like a phallic? Exactly. That's right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phallic symbol, actually, uh, that's, that's supposed to represent the goddess of fertility. Um, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger 
than any of the kings of Israel before him. Okay, so you can tell he was a nasty guy, okay? Uh, during his reign, Ha'il from Bethel rebuilt Jericho at the, uh, at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn son. He made the foundation at the cost of Zegub, his second son. He set up the gates according to the word of the Lord spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. And then we get to Elijah. Starting with chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, serve during these years, there will be no dew or rain except at my word. So he's, he's proclaiming a drought. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, go east and hide in the Wadi Cherith, south yeah, east of the Jordan. What's a Wadi? Dried up riverbed. Oh, pardon? Dried up riverbed. Uh, let's be a little more accurate there. Dried up the source of water. <laughs> no, a, a Wadi <laughs> is a seasonal riverbed. It, it, it's, it's not dried up. You're dead. You're getting picky. Well, no, it's important. Get, no, it's important. <laughs> yeah, it's important because in Mars, they're, they're now searching out dried up riverbeds to see where life had been. Wadis are places where life does thrive for a certain period of time in the, every year and then dries up. So it's, it's, it's unlike a, the River Jordan that always flows. It's a river that flows, but only seasonally. You shall drink of the wadi, and I have commanded ravens to feed you there. So he left and did as the Lord had commanded. He left and remained by the wadi Cherith, east of the Jordan. Ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and the bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the wadi. So he was doing all right. In the middle of the, in the, middle of the drought, he was getting bread and meat. But after some time, the wadi ran dry because no rain had fallen in the land. And then we, we go on uh, to the next incident where he meets this, this woman. Uh, and we're familiar with that story where he uh, instructs her to continue to fill her jars of oil. And the jars of oil uh, never dry, run out until the, until the drought is ended. Um, and then we have... Uh, <clears throat> In uh, chapter 18, this uh, this battle between Elijah and all of the prophets of Jezebel. And remember, Elijah is the one who calls down God and God brings fire upon his, upon his sacrifice. Whereas the 500 prophets of the, of the, uh, the God all haven't been able to do that. And so then Elijah has all 500 of those prophets put to death. Well, you can imagine that Jezebel is not happy with that. Okay. And so Jezebel um, threatens to kill him. If you turn to uh, chapter 19, they have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, that he had murdered all the prophets by the sword. Jezebel then sent a messenger to Elijah and said, May the gods do thus to me and more, if by this time tomorrow I have not done with your life, what was done to each of them. So he threatens to kill them. Okay, okay so poor old, poor old Elijah runs for his life once again. And that's the setting that we hear uh, this, this Sunday's upcoming reading. Uh, first of all, he, he goes out into the desert and just wants to die, if you're familiar with that. Um, and God, however, gives him food to drink uh, and water to uh, food to eat and water to drink, and tells him to to travel to Mount Horeb. So he tra walks for forty days and forty nights to Mount Horeb. Uh, where is Mount Horeb? Isn't that where Abraham um, made his sacrifice? No, no. Jerusalem. It's one of those. Horeb, Horeb is another name for Sinai. 
It goes all the way. He goes all the way from Samaria, walks all the way over to Sinai, Mount Sinai, someplace um, in, the, in, the, in the desert there. I'm not sure where it is, but it's, it's the same mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. Okay, so it's, it's significant to note that. Okay, Horeb is just another name for Mount Sinai. Okay, got that? Okay, so, so now the setting is, is clear for you. Let's look at the reading. Mary Ann, how about reading that? Uh, yeah, we're... Are we at 19? 1 Kings nine? chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Yeah, but do you want to start with 1 or 9? Uh, we can start with chapter 9. No, verse. Verse 9? I'm sorry, verse 9, right? Right. Um, let me see if these are clear. A little bit. Um, then he came to a cave where he took shelter. But the word of the Lord came to him. So this is what, after traveling his 40 days, he comes to a cave up on the mountain, okay? Now, we won't hear this next part of 9, uh, it's called 9B, nine 9, uh, but we have God ask Elijah, go ahead. What? Why are you here? Jeannie? What chapter? 19, Jeannie. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, why are you here, Elijah? He answered, I have been most zealous for the Lord, the God of all hosts. But the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Now, we don't hear that here a, a little bit in, uh, on Sunday, but it's important because what we're hearing is a conversation between God and, and Elijah. You've got to understand Elijah is upset. He's, he's, he's afraid for his life. He could put to death, and yet he's been faithful to God. So he's wondering what's going on here. So God continues. And the Lord said, go outside and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will be passing by. A strong and heavy wind was rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a tiny whispering sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. A that's, voice. That's that's where that's where, <laughs> that's where Sunday's reading ends. Okay. Um, okay. I like your translation. Tiny little sound. Mine just says a light, silent sound. Oh. Yes. Yeah, Sunday's reading from the. Yeah, this is a good example. For example, the North New American Bible um, having various translations. The, what you have, Laura, and I, what I have, is a light sound. The it is actually more accurate, um, and what we'll hear on Sunday is a tiny whispering sound. So you see the various translations, uh, even though they try to try to be clearer and clearer, sometimes they're not. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So light whispering sound. Monsignor, let's make a comment on that. I have an app on my phone that I use to do liturgy of the hours and the daily readings and everything. And um, it's slightly different from the lectionary, um, or at least for some of the reading. I don't know. I'm not really clear on it. but. I find that I'll, I'll be reading and I'll say, oh, I love this so much. And I'll go into my other Bible app, which is NAB. And nine times out of 10, it's just not as poetic. It's just not as beautiful. And I find myself copying and scribbling it down because I want to see that particular translation. I don't know. Does that ever happen to anybody? <laughs> that and that's why it's good to have various translations or better yet, 
to learn your Hebrew. Right. <laughs> it's on my bucket list. Yeah, but, bucket list. but I would assume I would assume everybody has their favorite translation. Um, I personally like the older versions. I like the I like the poetry of the, of the language. Well, it, it, it depends on which version it is and, and which particular chapter it is. Did you have a comment? Yeah, no, I wanted to know why does it end there this Sunday when a good part follows, you know, as uh -huh. read on? <laughs> a really good question, Jeannie. Um, remember the first reading, the first, the first reading is always presented to us to prepare us for the gospel. Yeah. And so the first reading this Sunday is preparing us for the gospel where we see uh, Jesus being presented as God. Mm -hmm. And so here we see Elijah having God being presented to him. So that's the purpose of the reading, just to prepare us for the gospel. But you're absolutely right, Julie. We're going to continue to read this because here we see a very interesting and important conversation between Elijah and God. Yeah, so, so I think get... that's the best part. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> Well, go, I'll, Jeannie, go. <laughs> I'll, I'll send your recommendation to the, uh, the church <laughs> in, in the Vatican. And uh, oh, okay. Thank after you, you oh. and I are both dead, they, they may look at it. <laughs> well, well, actually, I wouldn't bother, honey. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for our sakes, let, let's look at it. Because as Jeannie said, you're absolutely right. The, the very important pass, part of this passage. Go ahead. Wait, uh, I have a question. I think you already answered it. But who please puts together the before readings to go with the gospel? Like, there's got to be some Vatican committee, or does this go way back? Or this is one of those dumb questions, which isn't really dumb. That's important. This is, this is a very smart question, very good question. Um, and what let me repeat what I was now. Huh. Most of us are old enough to remember. You may not remember, but you're old enough to remember. <laughs> that before Vatican II, we had a completely different cycle. There was a one-year cycle for all the readings. And um. Um, they didn't really correspond. And in fact, uh, there were, we didn't have homilies, we had sermons, you'll recall that. Uh, mm -hmm. There was actually, uh, every diocese had its own syllabus. So we priests were given uh, a syllabus of topics that we were to cover. Really? Yeah, yeah. Based. Who, based who, made, the, who made the syllabus? Each diocese made their own. Oh. They, they, received, they received advice from... There is in the Vatican one of one of the one of the twenty eight dicasteries in the Vatican actually is the Commission for the Liturgy. Very important. I'm sorry, Congregation for the Liturgy. Very very important because we are a liturgical community, uh, and down through the ages since since the uh, Council of Trent, uh, the Congregation for the Liturgy has set the readings and and the liturgical calendar. But as I said before, Vatican II, we usually didn't even pay attention to the readings. That's why you find older priests still struggle with this because they don't understand. They, they, they had their own syllabus. Let's follow that. Um, with the reforms of Vatican II, uh, they went back to the earliest church documents that they could find and found that very, very early on, around 100 AD, there developed a, a, a custom, a tradition of, of the readings following a particular order. That's why we call it ordinary time. It's, it's to show the order of God's time for our salvation. And so outside of the Advent and Christmas season and Lent and Easter season, they developed this 33 or 34 week uh, calendar oh. that allows us to explore God's revelation to us in its fullness in the Gospels, but 
anticipated in the first reading. Got that? And so that's so, brilliant. Yeah, it is. It is. So, so uh, the readings now are very carefully prepared. Uh, we have, a, as, you, as you know, we have a three-year cycle for the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are featured in one of those three years. This year is the year of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and then the first reading is always selected to prepare us for the Gospel. And then the second reading, uh, as I've explained to you before, gets a little messy because they also wanted to uh, include as much of the New Testament readings outside the Gospels for everybody. So over, over the course of three years, we hear almost the entire New Testament readings outside the Gospel. Hmm. It's kind of ironic because they're very different than originally. I'm sorry? It's kind of ironic because, you know, when I think of the early liturgical celebrations, the, the reading of the, the books from the Bible, that was the only time that people got to hear those words because they couldn't read. And nowadays, they're making sure everything gets read as much as possible, but we can still read it on our own as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of ironic that they didn't, yeah. didn't read as much of the Bible percentage-wise as they do now. But you're absolutely right. But also, people were much less educated back then, and so they were trying to keep it as, as simple as possible to get the, the basic message across. And that's what the syllabus was followed. The syllabus actually followed here in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. The syllabus followed the Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> so we oh. teachings over the course of the year. We would touch on some of the basic teachings of the church. You had said that. Um, each reading is the same in a three-year cycle. I'm sorry? Each gospel reading is the same over a three-year cycle. So in three years, we'll hear the same reading that we hear this Sunday. How about the first and second reading? Are those exactly all, 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 the, all the readings repeat themselves in a three-year cycle. So, there are parts of the Bible that are not touched upon. Oh yeah, oh sure. Huge section. The book of Leviticus, we seldom hear from the book of Leviticus. Um, let's see. The book of Baruch, we hear from it once. Uh, yeah, there's several, several sections of the Bible you never hear. And is that the same for the daily readings as well? Uh, the daily readings follow a two-year cycle. <laughs> Just to make it easier. Just to make it more complicated. <laughs> and then, and then, and then the daily mass and you'll hear, hear the reading that you heard yesterday. And then, you know, like sometimes it, it overlaps and it coincidentally repeats. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when they, so when they were making, when they're putting this together in the cycle, does the first reading always go with the gospel, or do they change first readings every three years? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't make that clear. Yeah. If it's on a three-year yeah. cycle, do they reevaluate after the three years to find other readings to precede the gospel? Um, Why are you laughing? Well, because it's a legitimate understand. question. It's a, it, it is a legitimate question, but but you're you're not thinking as as the church thinks. Uh, no, I'm thinking like a professor with students in front of me. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. But you're but the the, the church um, works in much slower times, slower ways. It took us. Well, push, pish, pish. You need women in there. What difference does that make? We get things done. Oh, do you really? Okay. We do. We do. Trust me. Okay. Um, the, 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 the church has set this calendar and set it back in 1970. Um, it hasn't oh. changed. It hasn't changed since 1970. And what would make them decide to change it? Mm, maybe another Vatican Council. Hmm. Are you saying you are to be great? I, I think they're brilliant. And I love that the fact that the uh, Protestants have adopted yeah. 
And I think that the fact mm -hmm. that that lends itself more towards universality among Christian religions. Yep. Yeah, that's for so, sure. So I, I think consistency here is key. <laughs> I would go for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I think we can all admit, <laughs> after, after three years, after three years, you've forgotten the lesson anyway, haven't you? Yeah. Yes. After, after three weeks, I've forgotten it. <laughs> hey, and I'm down to three days. I can't, I can't even remember the gospel two minutes later. You know, and I'm holding the donut. I'm like, can you remember one thing from the gospel so you can get your donut? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so that, Monsignor, Monsignor, I know you've said this, just patience is a virtue, but please, what is the difference between a sermon and a homily? Ah, yeah, it, it is a very important question. A, a sermon is a theological discourse, as I mentioned Oh. We, had a, we had a syllabus that we had to follow, and we, we taught on these various topics. Uh, uh, transubstantiation, the Trinity, um, Mother Church, um, sin, um, redemption, the sacraments. Uh, I remember these. <clears throat> yeah. uh, we, we studied this when I first entered the seminary back in 1960. Uh, we never, I never implemented it because I wasn't ordained until 1978, and by that time, the new changes had come in. A homily is the, an explication, an explanation, and explication of the Gospels. Uh, uh, the, the, the easiest way that I always uh, remind, remember what I'm supposed to do in a homily is what, so what, and then what. So first we, we explain what the readings mean, what their significance is, and then, so what? How does that apply to our lives? And then, then what? That is, what do we do with it? How do we take this lesson and apply it in our lives? That makes sense? Would you say that all the old talks that Fulton Sheen gave on television, would you say that they're sermons? Oh yeah, very clearly. We really wanted to get good Catholic sermons to watch Fulton Sheen on YouTube. And they're excellent. They are really excellent. But you'll notice they're very long. You know, they're, they're half hour long. Mm -hmm. Homilies are, are supposed to be four to seven minutes long. And and the, the fallacy is, or at least the, the, the weakness of, the, of that theory is, it assumes that the audience already understands a lot of this. And so this, this, mm -hmm. the homilies are meant to just to highlight the important parts, assuming that you already have the foundation. And that's that's why this Bible study is so helpful, because you have the foundation walking in to Mass, so the, the homily makes more sense to you. Mm -hmm. so, okay. You should say I, 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 the Bible study so everybody can... <laughs> well, it's actually on the, it's on the website, and I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm surprised to see we get 50 to 60 people watch it every week. So, so you're all stars. Pay attention, okay? Make sure you make sure you comb your hair, Marianne. <laughs> I did this morning. I know you did. did. <laughs> anyway, yeah. though, um, I've <laughs> always I've always enjoyed um, comparing it. That's the wrong word. Just listening to your presentation and then also listening to Monsignor Carroll because they're very different. And you, you have to love him because he's a scholar and he's always got a scholarly book that he's going to bring in um, to help explain. It's, again, I just, um, I love both of your tech, you know, you're both different and they're both very good. But but you but you notice the difference. Um, yeah, he was ordained in 1962 before all these changes. Exactly. So never really mm -hmm. had a background, and so he 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 uses extra biblical accounts to support it, um, which is more the sermon style. Well, exactly. You know, I, yeah. I I focus very heavily on the scriptures because that's the living word of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for explaining. That was really good. Is that helpful? Good, good. Okay. Let me, uh, let me give you a contract. 
there. There's when we grew up, uh, and I grew up in Catholic, in the Slovak Catholic parish in New Jersey, and we had a, a visiting priest who happened to be the chaplain at Rollway State Prison, and he would start every sermon by saying, "The kids today, you know, you see it, you see it on TV, you hear it on the radio, you read it in the papers, you see it in the magazine, it's on and on and on. The kids today are just no good." And all the old people, all the old people in church would nod their heads. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And every single hot, every single sermon would start that way. And where it went from there, only God knew, because it had nothing to do with sacrament or or literature or water. I don't know where the heck. But but I will tell you that that sixty five years later, we still remember this guy. <laughs> but, and you know, Monsignor Browers has said that you know God moves in His own time, and I think sometimes the church does too. Because I mean, you know, Vatican is like it was like fifty years or sixty years after Vatican II. It still seems like we're trying to implement parts of it. Like it didn't happen like the day after they closed the council. That's not when everything changed. It was like it was like people sat back and said, oh, wait, let me think about this. How are we going to do this? Or, you know, and so the church kind of moves in its, also in my opinion, moves in its own timeline, different than the timeline that we, that we typically move in. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jeannie, to answer your question, let's, let's continue the, the, the reading because you're absolutely right. There's some really good points here. So I'll, I'll continue with that reading on the uh, Verse 13, going to verse 14. I'm sorry, 13b, 13b. Well, she can continue. You put up with me with my cataracts last week. So I'm yeah, no, 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 no. Mary, I'm, I'm asking Mary Ann to do okay. that. Yes. <laughs> put up with me. I'll read all the time. I <laughs> Jeannie, I love you. You know that. Uh, when, after we've had this little tiny whispering sound, when he heard this, Elijah, I'm sorry. Uh, when he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, why are you here? He replied, I, I have been most zealous for the Lord of the hosts, but the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the sword. I alone left, and they seek to take my life. Okay. Notice, notice, oh, Elijah, notice, Elijah, sorry, notice Elijah just repeats himself, okay, as if God didn't get it the first time around. Remember, we, we heard that uh, in this little section that we will not hear on Sunday, uh, starting with verse 10. Elijah says the same thing, okay? We, we do that in our prayer, don't we? We say the same thing over and over again, hoping maybe God will hear us this time. He heard us the first time. <laughs> so now it's time for us to listen. Okay? Go ahead. Yes, but the pedagogical teaching, as you say, times it's only a third hears you each time. <laughs> oh, that's that's a true. Pet. No, that's a pedagogical technique. I'm just doing it. Yes, for human. No, for, take yes, yes, for human, yeah. not for God. Oh yeah. Yeah, God hears it the first time. I know. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking from my human perspective. Anyhow, go so, take the road back to the desert near Damascus. The Lord said to him, "When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king of. Is it Aram? I don't have any glasses on here. Um, then you shall anoint John." Son of Nimsha, as king of Israel, and Elisha. Sorry? It's Jehu, not John. Okay, as I I don't have the glasses on. Okay. <laughs> um, Jehu, all right, son of Nimsha, as king of Israel, and Elisha, son of Shaput, of whatever that one is, Abel, oh, no. that one, as prophet. <laughs> Succeed you. If anyone escapes the sword of Hazel, Ye what is it? Je Jehu? Jehu, right. Yeah, Jehu will kill him. If he escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill him. That I will leave 7,000 men in Israel, all those who have knelt to Baal or kissed him. Okay, so, so pay attention here. Um, and you're right, Jeannie, if, if we use this 
poor reading, it would actually prepare us even better for the gospel. Um, but what we're seeing here is, yes, Elijah uh, has the privilege of seeing God. And what does he do? He goes and tells him what he wants. Mm -hmm. God has different plans for him, though, doesn't he? Elijah wants to be saved, to have his life spared, and to live happily ever after. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What does God tell him to do? Go down and make life even more difficult for yourself. Go and anoint these people, and then I will work through them to purify the people so that those who are spared, those 7,000, they will be the ones who continue my work. Okay, so it's a very important lesson that, that, that when we turn to God in prayer, absolutely give him your concerns. But then make sure you give him plenty of time to tell you what he calls you to do. And then have the humility and courage to do it. Wow. But, but you'll see that that leads us right in this Sunday's gospel. Okay, got that? I was just reading something recently that said prayer time is one, one third praying and two thirds listening. I would agree, at least. I agree. And I don't, I don't think we do that enough. Yeah. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. we do. We do this. We just say, 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 and then we think we're done. You're absolutely right. Unfortunately, that's what most people do. Uh, the time of silence is actually the most profitable time for prayer. You're absolutely right. So, uh, as I mentioned, this this prepares us for the gospel. This, this Sunday's gospel is again from Matthew. We're in the year of Matthew, and we're just continuing where we picked off, picked up, uh, left off last week. That is Matthew 14, starting with verse 22. Joanne, how are your glasses? My glasses are great. Okay. <laughs> I will. I really just don't have my soundtrack. The walking on the water, is that when you want me to start? That's right. Okay. Now, be before we do this, remember um, that Jesus last week had gone to this deserted place across the, the Sea of Galilee, called in what is modern day. Uh, on heights. He, he wanted to get away. He needed to get away. Why? Well, he had just heard about the death of John the Baptist, his cousin, and he needed to pray. He needed to spend some time to, to listen to God and reevaluate what his mission was. Okay. He gets there, however, and what he finds is a huge crowd, and so he heals them and he feeds them. But he still needs to pray. Okay. So that's the setting for this Sunday's gospel. Okay. Go ahead, Joanne. Then he made the disciples get into the boat and precede him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up to the mountain on the, the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Okay, stop for stop for okay. So notice notice what he does. This is this is what most of us don't do. Sure, he, he, he knew he needed to do God's work. God's work. Those people need to be healed, they need to be fed. But then he still found time to pray. So he dismisses the crowd. He said, leave me alone. I need to pray. And notice it says here, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Anybody who have been to the Golan Heights know there are no mountains. There. So why would why would Matthew say he went up to the mountain to pray? Are you saying that there was not a geological event that flattened the land? No, it wasn't. It wasn't geological. It was spiritual. It's a theological statement. Yeah. Remember the people of Egypt. 
Israel encounter God up on the mountain, whether it was Mount Sinai, whether it was Mount Carmel, whether it was Bethel. That's where, that's where the people of ancient Israel encountered God. So Jesus it, went up to encounter God. It's the holy city on the hill. There you go. All that stuff. Yes, okay. So it's a theological Go ahead. Meanwhile, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Stop, 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 stop right there, stop right there. Okay. Now, here it's very important for us not to confuse this gospel passage with an earlier gospel passage. Hold this and let's turn to Matthew 8. Starting was, that with the one, was that one that was Matthew. read on Monday's Mass? Daily Mass? Matthew? Yeah. Was talk on, on Monday? Because it was the walking on the water. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, this past Monday, the weekday Mass, yes, we read this. Yes, exactly, right. Yes, yes. But okay. if, if you turn to Matthew 8, we see another incident where they're at, uh, in a storm. Um, the calming of the storm at sea. Right. You want me to start there? Please. He got into a boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a violent storm came up on the, uh, on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by waves, but he was asleep. So pay attention here. In this account, they're in danger of, of, drown of, of, of drowning. The, the boat is about to rage in the swamp. Remember back then, um, they had small, shallow boats, and they weren't very stable. And the Sea of Galilee frequently had storms. And if you look geographically, the Sea of Galilee is it's not far from the Mediterranean Sea, but it, it's on the other side of a mountain range. Where Jerusalem is in the middle. So what happens regularly, the wind blows from the Mediterranean across the mountains, over the mountains, and then rushes down into the valley where the Sea of Galilee is. And, and this usually just happens frequently, uh, especially in the summer, uh, overnight. And so in the earlier hours of the morning, you can get these strong winds um, that caused the Sea of Galilee to become rather rough. That, that's, that was common, okay? So, but in the first account, uh, this boat is being swamped, okay? The second account, the account that we hear on Sunday, that's not the case. Be careful if you notice the difference, okay? You'll notice that here it just says, go back to um, the Sunday's Gospel. Chapter 14, it just says, and verse 24, the boat was being tossed about by the waves for the wind was against it. And that's a common occurrence. It, they, weren't, they weren't in danger of having the boat swamped and then drowned. But when the, um, it says here, uh, uh, during the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them who were walking on the sea. That's what frightened them. They were terrified. It is a ghost, they said. They cried out in fear. Why would they be terrified by somebody walking on the sea? It's supposed to be impossible. They can't do it. He drowned. He drowned. Pardon? They thought he was drowned walking on the sea. Right? Well, he seemed to be doing just fine, thank you very much. He might have been on a skateboard. Who knows? You know, just, just, he was just walking across. Why would it terrify? Why would because, it, why would it just be fascinating? Because it's humanly not possible. Uh, they thought he was a ghost. They thought that he they would lose him. I think. Did they even know who it was? No, they thought it was a ghost. That's right. They thought it was a ghost. Uh, and he says it is I, Jesus. He tells them. That's right. Maybe maybe they just like. Um, 
you know, whenever you have that supernatural presence, they always say, do not be afraid. You know, like, it's like the fear of God, maybe. You know, just like, it's awesome. This is a perfect example of why we have these readings every three years. We went through this three years ago, and I explained very clearly why they were afraid. I'm using the same notes. I want to hear. Pardon? We didn't do this during the summer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, this was <laughs> it was in it was in Mark's gospel, and that was uh, that was at a time where we were we were having this. Okay. The reason the reason they were afraid was because so many lives were lost at sea. Uh, they thought that they saw a ghost. It was a premonition that they would not. Ah. Oh. The, the okay. Sailors had this folklore that ships would go down and people would drown after they would see a ghost. That's that's why they were afraid. Okay. You know, Monsignor, there's a, when you talk, there's a, a garble coming. Yes, yeah, there's an echo. It's hard to understand you. Yeah, we might have too many people with their with their microphones on. If you could turn your microphone off, please. Unless unless you're you're reading. Joanne, leave yours on, please. I have it on. Thank you. I'm on senior. May I ask you? This might sound stupid, but these are two separate incidences. These are this isn't the same thing. Yeah. They, yes, they are two separate incidences. In the first one, Jesus in, is in the boat with them. In the boat. Yeah. And that, that has always impressed me. It's one of my favorite gospels in that um, we we forget to trust him. And especially in these times, he keeps reminding us, just hold on to my hand. And as you said at the outset, have we ever gone? Through, it looks like we've got the pestilence, the plague, the flood. It's all happening. Just hold on to his hand. And it's that trust because so many people are complaining right now drives me crazy. But. You just have to think, I, I'm just going to trust the uh, sacred heart of Jesus. I place my trust in name. And that, that gospel just screams that at us. You're, okay. you're right. I'm target. You're absolutely right. If I, were, if I were going to give a homily this Sunday, I'm not because we've got the missionary speaking. That, that would exactly be my theme. And both readings make it very clear, don't they? That God has a plan for us. And it's in the midst of the struggles that we face that we are challenged, invited, called to fulfill God's plan. And we think we ourselves worried. You're wasting your time and energy doing that. See, what I've, always, what I've always liked about this one is that it's the comparison of divinity with humanity. In other words, the divinity is not afraid. Humanity is like, hey, I'm going to sink. And then Peter starts to go down and Jesus has to grab his hand. And it's exactly. sort of like, you know, it's like, boy, we need a little more sort of divinity faith in us so we don't start going down. That's right. I think this point is so correct. Um, people just don't have enough faith right now. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, sure. It's going to work out. It really is. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay, Joanne, if you continue, please. Dory, I'm really struggling here. Oh, my gosh. It's so difficult. Marianne, can you put your, can you, uh, YouTube yourself, please? Oh. We're getting, we're getting. Yes, this. sir. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's wonderful. During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once, Jesus spoke to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. As Laura said a few moments ago, throughout, throughout scripture, not just the New Testament, throughout scripture, over and over again, whenever there is some sort of divine revelation, one of the first things that we hear is, not be afraid. God is always in charge. He hasn't forgotten us. God is always in charge. Now pay attention here. This is very, very interesting. Um, the Greek 
not the Hebrew, but the Greek translation of the Hebrew's gospel, uses ego eimi, which translates more accurately into I am. So at least in the Greek version of Matthew's gospel, we hear Jesus proclaim that he is God, Yahweh. Okay. Now, that's unusual. In fact, it's the only one of the few places in Matthew's gospel that we hear in any way refer to himself as divine. Usually, he refers to himself as a self-deprecating term, the son of man. We've heard about that before. But here we see when they're another three, Jesus makes it very clear that he is God. Okay, go ahead. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Okay, so so what Peter's doing is I think we've never seen a ghost. And so Peter is challenging this ghost, saying, Well, if it, if it really is you, Jesus, and not a ghost, then you can command me to come to the water, go up the water across the water. I always wondered about that. I thought, well, what's going to keep a ghost from lying? <laughs> but somehow Peter thought, well, if, if it's really Jesus, he's, he's, if, it's, if it's not Jesus, he's not going to say anything. Go ahead. He said, come, Peter. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. We so often <clears throat> focus on, on Peter altering in the faith. You know, when he's in the courtyard, or, uh, when when Jesus asks him, or when, when Jesus says he's going to suffer and die, and Peter counters him, we so often focus on Jesus and Peter faltering the faith. But here we see him actually stepping out in faith. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big step. It's a step out of the water. Go ahead. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Okay, stop, stop right there. If you look at your little footnote, you'll notice that this, Oh, you of little faith, um, that's, that verb is found only in Matthew's gospel. He kind of coined a phrase, um, and it occurs only one other time in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 28 17. Let's quickly turn to that. All this will be right back. Turn to Matthew 28 17. What, what was that? 28 17? Matthew 28 17. This is after the resurrection. This is when the resurrected Jesus encounters the apostles up at Galilee. Go ahead. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. And so the same word is used here as it is where Jesus meets them on the water. And, and this is linked very carefully. Remember I mentioned right before, Matthew's gospel isn't just a travelogue. It's not a Bible. It's a very careful prepare for the logical preparation. And here we see again uh, a good example of that. We're still getting feedback. Are the, are the people getting feedback? Yes. yes. It was really clear for a while. A few moments, yeah. Is anybody else? Uh, two, people are not, two people are not muted. Uh, that's the Joanne, you're very clear. I'm getting, I'm getting feedback. I'm, I'm and, like, when you try to speak, I can barely hear you. There's so much background noise. Yeah, yeah. And when I had a couple people are not muted. Um, well, I was muted, and then I was still getting feedback. Monsignor, can you mute everybody? Would that help? 
I don't. I don't. I, this is this is not a Zoom meeting. I don't have that uh, have that ability. Let's 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 let's. Okay. I, I see more people have muted themselves. Betsy, can you mute yourself? Can I what? Can you mute yourself? Let's see if that, let's see if that helps. Okay. No. Don't remove your video, remove your audio. <laughs> Okay. Come on back, Betsy. Come on back. Come on back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is that better or are you still getting good? Still getting feedback. Betsy, try my muting. Do what? Mute yourself. Don't, don't turn off your video. Turn off your audio. Turn off. The audio. The audio. Okay. What is it? Too many buttons. I understand. Too many buttons. See here, what happens if you move, move yourself? Oh no, no, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I'm gone again. You're gone again. You're still here. Okay. I actually see you here twice on my screen. Oh, Betsy. Yeah, I'm, I'm I here. <clears throat> I see Betsy here twice on my screen. I see oh. one muted and one not muted. Okay. Okay, that, that, that would cause some feedback too. You're clearer now, Monsignor, for me. Am I? Good. Okay, let's try that. Uh, so, so we see here at, at, at the very end of this time among us that that, that doubt still persists among the disciples, but he still, Jesus still, tells them to go and proclaim the gospel. And that's an important lesson to learn well. We will always have our doubts. That's what faith is all about. If we didn't have doubts, there wouldn't be a need for faith. But we need to have faith. And we need to continually strengthen ourselves in our faith. And how do we do that? By studying the Bible, by coming together as a community, by praying, and by listening so it's 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 a life task for us to continue to grow in our faith and that's why we hear these lessons over and over okay so let's let's get back to uh, matthew's gospel please monsignor um can i make a suggestion if you low i think you're the one that has the feedback if you lower your volume i because if you have your volume up too high, you actually feedback on yourself. And I only hear the feedback when you speak, which means that it's probably coming from your speakers. Okay, let me turn it down a little bit. Can you, is this better? Can you hear me at all now? Yes. You can, you can hear me all right? Yes, perfectly. I think it's much better. Okay. I, I, what I, I turned on my, my speakers so I can hear you clearly. Ah, that could very well be so let's let's see back now. Lower. Oh well, we're trying. Still feedback. Still feedback. Still feedback okay, well uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> not everything is in our control. I don't know what else to suggest. I think it's a system issue today because of the weather. Well that could also be I mean with all the lines down and all kinds of problems. That, that could be that too. Anyway, so after, let's, let's do uh, verse 32. After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Oh, we lost my senior? My senior? Maybe, maybe he has a little. <laughs> oh my gosh, we can <laughs> There you are. Now he's muted. Now he's muted. Now you're You're muted, muted. You're muted. <laughs> you're muted Monsignor. You're muted. I can't hear you. 
I just did I just did what Betsy was doing rather than I, I tried to mute myself to see if that would make a difference. Oh, you got well, it. Ended up yeah. you scared of heck ended up leaving the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> we, we became big doubters at that point when you just <laughs> thought we were sinking. <laughs> Okay, so you got down to verse 33? Yes. Did you want me to continue? No. No, that, that's where it ends. Okay. Right. Now again, pay attention. Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel present this same story, but with some significant differences. In Matthew's gospel, we hear, those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And so in Matthew's gospel, they recognize Jesus' power uh, as he's able to um, just walk on water. He's just fed 5,000. They recognize that he has some special special powers here, okay? He now walks on water. So they proclaim that he is the Son of God. Now, with Matthew's Gospel, we, we see that. Let's turn to Mark's Gospel, and we'll see a very interesting set of differences, okay? Let's turn to Old Matthew, and let's turn to Mark 6. Are you still getting feedback? Not as much. Okay. It's better than it was. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. good. But Matthew. you know, it's kind of like the good old days when we were in the parish center, and we had to, like, get the microphone just right, you know. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Good old Mark day. chapter That's six. Uh, Mark six, did you say? Mark chapter six. And what verse? Starting with verse 45. Verse 45. Got it. The walking on the water. Then he made his disciples get into the boat and precede him to the other side toward Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Okay, so in Mark's gospel, we actually see where he's going to. Okay, so we, we, we are very clear that this is indeed, uh, he's going from, they're going from east to west. They're going to Bethsaida, which is close to Capernaum. Okay. And when he had taken leave of them, he went off to the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was far out on the sea, and he was alone on shore. Oh, this is different. Then, then he saw that they were tossed about while rowing, for the wind was against them. See, notice in Mark's gospel, Jesus sees that they're out yes. on the boat, okay? Very interesting. Remember, Mark's gospel frequently has these, these interesting little details that you don't find in the other gospels. Go ahead. About the fourth watch of the night, he came towards them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. Notice but here, he's, just, he's really booking. They're, here they are trying to row, and they can't make any headway. He's just walking along and passing them by. <laughs> <laughs> but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. They had all seen him and were terrified. But at once he spoke with them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. He got into the boat with them, and the wind died down. Now, he doesn't talk about... Peter coming That's up. That's right. No mention of Peter. They were completely astounded. They had not understood the incident of the loaves. On the contrary, their hearts were hardened. So does that mean they still didn't believe? And yet in in Matthew, you are the son of God. With Mark, we still don't know who you are. Notice how significant the differences are. Okay. So this is another wonderful example in, in the Gospels where we see the Gospel writers take a particular uh, event or a particular pericope and make a message out of it. In, in Mark's Gospel, remember Mark's Gospel, we, we frequently talk about the theme of the Messianic uh, secret where Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody about it, this until the Son of Man rises. Part of that is because he wants them not to say anything until they get the whole story, his death and resurrection. But part of it is also because they're just not getting it. Remember in Mark's Gospel, three times Jesus says, I've been with you for so long and 
still you do not understand. Okay, so you can you can just hear the frustration. And so in Mark's gospel, we, we hear this theme of not understanding, even on the part of the disciples. Whereas in Matthew's gospel, correct, Matthew's gospel is related to a Jewish Christian community. And so Matthew's gospel frequently uses incidences to show that Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament, that he is indeed greater than all the prophets of the Old Testament. And here we see that Matthew's gospel is helping the people of his time come to realize that, that Jesus is even greater than Elijah. Elijah encountered God up on the mountain. Jesus is God. Not only does he, does he have the power to to palm the sea, as we see in the first reading, in the first encounter, in the boat, here he's actually able to walk on water. Now, who can walk on water but God himself? Okay, so so it's, it's interesting that, that you learn the theological messages that are behind these readings, and each of the Gospels is going to be slightly different. You see that? Mm-hmm. Now, can you still hear me loudly enough? Yes. Yeah. But there's still a feedback. A little bit. It's better. What if What if I turn down my volume a little bit? That's that's yeah. That's what you should do. Try to turn your volume down. Do you know how to do that on your computer? Yes. How's that? Is that any better? There's Hello? still feedback. No, there's still feedback. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird. I think it's just, I think it's just a system today because in the, in the past three weeks we've had really good, really good audio on the meeting. So I think it's a, it's an anomaly today. Yeah. So yeah, it's always it's always crystal clear except today. Yeah. I agree. Right. Most of the people are muted. So I think it's just a yeah. Can I, can I ask a question about this particular account? So this is in Mark. Right. And I'm always trying to figure out who are these people in Syria that, that are listening to these accounts. Like, they're in persecution. We're, they're not converts from Judaism. They're not, or it's a mixture. I'm trying to figure out why are they why are they getting hit over the head? And they're so hard to part. Are you, are you, are you have okay? Oh, you mean in Mark's gospel? Yeah. Yeah, but most scripture scholars think that Mark's gospel is going to be before the persecution that he had. Okay, so it's just when they're, when they're, the missionary work is beginning, they're moving up into Syria. And these people just aren't understanding, just aren't getting it. Um, and so, gospel writer is using the struggle that the disciples had before the, before the resurrection. As a, a, a similarity to, to the, the struggles and experience that the people in Syria have, because um, they're still they're still very much like Romans. They don't believe in God at all, and so it's helping them to understand that first of all there is a God and that Jesus is God. Well, it's a hard lesson to learn if you're if you're just not even believing in God. You get that. Yeah, so I guess that kind of explains how I don't even understand that God is all powerful. Whereas the Jews would have gotten that immediately. So they didn't really have and they, they saw right away, oh, that's the son of God. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good, real good, real good question. Okay. Monsignor, uh, uh, the last sentence, Monsignor, can you hear me? Monsignor. Yes. The last sentence, uh, after he walked on water, on the contrary, their hearts were hardened. Why would their hearts be hardened after seeing him walking on the sea? Okay, well, as I, as I just explained, it, it, it's Mark, Mark, who is truly powerful in his day, as they're struggling with with believing who God, who Jesus really is. And so as they're struggling, he's trying to encourage them by saying, even the disciples struggle. It's not as we really understand who Jesus is in the death and resurrection that you come to recognize the whole rest. 
Does that make sense? Sort of. Sort of. Did they think he was a magician or something? That he could walk on water? I mean, that's a big feat. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> There's no question about it. Now, I'm getting all kinds of feedback. Yes. Yeah. I could hardly understand Laura. Yeah. I can, I can hardly understand Jeannie. I can hardly understand. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think you're in Syria. <laughs> good, good. Okay. Do you, do you call Mr. Who do you call? <laughs> so, the, the reason I, I present these two gospels is to help you understand that the lessons are going to be slightly different. But in both cases, what do we see? That God, Jesus is in God. He even has the power to walk on water. And all we need to do is reach our hands out to Jesus, and he will save us. So as Joanne said earlier, in the midst of all this coronavirus pandemic, and the storms, and the earthquakes, and the fires, trust in God, and he will, he will take care of you. Be assured of that. And in fact, he'll challenge you to do even more. Okay, that, that's the message. It's a, it's, a, it's a very important message for all time, but especially for us today, okay? Good, I'm, I'm gonna call it quiz. I'm, I'm getting all kinds of feedback. Uh, so let's let's hope by September 3rd it's, it's much clearer, okay? <laughs> good, have a, have a good few weeks and we'll see you in September, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Very Bye. Have wonderful holidays, Father. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you Bye now. Thank you again. Stay, stay Thank well. you. Stay safe. Be safe. Thank you. Bye. Stay well. Yeah, stay healthy. Stay healthy. You too. Stay well, my dear. Bye now. Bye. See you, Jack. Bye, Ronnie. See you, Constance. Take care. And Maria, good to have you here. Oh, Joanne, you you very like... much. Joanne, I didn't know that you were here, too. Good for you. Bye, Joyce.